from, it's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Akim Kemp from the University of Waterloo. Akim has done work in a very wide range of topics, including cosmology, quantum field theory and curved space time, spectral geometry, sampling theory, quantum information and machine learning, just to name a few. He is somebody whose work I follow, as I think he has an eye for interesting problems, sometimes quite interdisciplinary ones, and he manages to make very good progress on them. And today he's going to tell us about correlations, representations, and the emergence of space-time. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for the kind invitation. I'm really happy to give this presentation today. Uh, can you all hear me well? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so the topic of my talk is um, the question of what happens to space-time at high energies? Um, it's generally expected that space-time might be fluctuating, might be quantum fluctuating so much uh, at the Planck scale and above that one can no longer really speak of a space-time. The fluctuations take over and um, something else happens. However, it's not quite clear what <laughs> might happen. It, there seems to be a consensus that the usual notion of a space-time manifold breaks down, but it's not clear what it is replaced with. Or in other words, it's not clear how the space-time that we all know emerges from some non-geometric regime um, at the Planck energies. So today I want to talk about a proposal for how we might uh, approach that problem. And it's both physics and math and information theory. So let me start by asking what is a representation? And by that, I mean primarily yeah, mathematics. Yeah. So let's start with the narrow, usual definition of what is a representation. Traditional representation theory says that a representation is a map, let's call it phi, from some algebraic structure A, such as a group or a Lie algebra, into a space of matrices. And, you know, you all know representations of the special unitary groups, for example, from elementary particle physics. And in mathematics, what makes a map a representation is that it is structure preserving. So, for example, it preserves the structure of a group, the group multiplication. So the essential equation here is that when I take two elements, A and B, of a group, I can multiply them with each other to get another element, and then I map that into a matrix. And if that map is truly a representation, then I should be able equivalently to first map the group elements A and B into matrices and then multiply the matrices. So that's the simplest case of something that's structure preserving. And I'm going to talk about representations because the message of this presentation is that the physics of the emergence of space-time from a non-geometric regime might be the mathematics, might be um, mathematically describable as the emergence of a representation um, from an abstract structure. However, for that purpose, I will have to um, generalize the notion of a representation. And let's do a simple generalization. Let's consider a representation to be any structure preserving map. So A is some structure and B is some other structure and we call phi a representation if uh, the structure is preserved. So a simple example would be the axioms of a vector space. The axioms of a vector space uh, are an abstract structure, 
And we also have lots of concrete vector spaces to work with, and each concrete vector space is a representation of the axioms of a vector space. Something that we are very familiar with is in quantum mechanics that there are abstract states and abstract operators which have concrete representations, for example, position representations, momentum representations, and many other representations. And in this case, by the Stone and von Neumann theorem, they're all equivalent. In mathematics, the notion of representation in this wide and general sense would be called morphism. Um, category theory is all about it. So for example, every cohomology theory is in this sense a representation of differentiable manifolds in abelian groups. But I don't want to drift into pure math yet. Don't worry, it's going to be physics all the way, not that much math. Um, now, I also need the notion of an approximate representation, which is simply trying to get a representation, but it doesn't quite work. There are some um, inaccuracies there. So for example, classical phase space is used all over the place in engineering, but classical phase space is incorrect. Actual physics is a quantum phase space. It's the quantum Poisson algebra of quantum mechanics that we should use. And nevertheless, we often get away with using just a classical phase space as well. But that's not a true representation. The classical phase space is not a true representation. It's not an accurate representation of the algebra of positions and momenta in quantum mechanics. It's what might be called an approximate representation. It's good in a certain regime. But if we get to scales where h bar, h bar becomes significant, then we notice that the classical phase space is at best an approximation. Or let's look at um, an experimentalist building a quantum circuit. Well, that's an approximation. It's an approximate representation of the quantum algorithm that the experimentalist really wants to implement. Um, in real life, things are never quite as accurate as on paper. Or another uh, example of what would be an approximate representation is when we take space-time and represent it as usual as um, uh, at, um, a Lorentzian space-time with a Levi-Civita connection. This may only be approximate because there may be torsion. And um, well, we have no evidence for torsion, so we don't include it in our description. But just hypothetically, if space-time has torsion, just very little so that we haven't me measured it yet, then we would have to conclude that the usual description in terms of torsion-free manifolds has to be called an approximate representation of the true structure of space-time. So the moral I want to get across here is that approximate representations um, exist. They can be good in some regimes and bad in other regimes. And in some regimes, they're just impossible. For example, when we study the hydrogen atom, then the classical phase space is really no good. So that it's no longer an approximate representation, it's just invalid. So here now to the novelty. Um, I'm asking, could it be that quantum field theory Let's such, such as the standard model of particle physics on curved space-time is a representation. Could it be that the entire framework of quantum field theory and curved space-time is a representation of a more abstract structure, a more abstract structure that may also have other representations? So could there be an underlying abstract structure of which quantum field theory and curved space-time is an approximate representation, for example, at low energies, but maybe at high energies, the same abstract structure may have a different representation, for example, as quantum field theory on curved space-time, but maybe with a different dimension. And then maybe if we go to even higher energies, the same abstract structure might uh, no longer be representable on a, as quantum field theories on a curved space-time with this number of dimensions, but maybe with yet another number of dimensions. And maybe at very high energies, like the Planck energy, 
this same abstract structure simply may not possess a representation anymore in terms of a quantum field theory on any kind of Lorentzian manifold. It simply may not possess such a representation anymore. As you see, the idea here is that there could be one abstract structure that describes nature all the way through all energy scales. And the physics that we see as phenomenology is determined by the representation theory of that abstract structure. At low energies, this abstract structure would have a representation in the form of the standard model of particle physics on curved space time that we know, but at higher energies, that representation may become approximate, then a worse approximation, and then it's just no longer good. And then at even higher energies, it might acquire again, this abstract structure might acquire again a representation in terms of a quantum field theory on curved space time. And then at even higher energies, it might lose that again. Or at sufficiently high energies, it just may no longer be representable in terms of a quantum field theory on a curved space time at all. It might have other representations, but not anything familiar to us now, not of the form of quantum fields living on a curved space time manifold. <clears throat> so today I want to report on the search for such an abstract, simpler structure that might uh, describe physics across all energies and whose representation theory might account for the phenomenology that we observe. So how could quantum field theory on curved space-time be a representation? And what could it be a representation of? So here but I give you a can I, just, yes? just to interrupt, can I... Yes, to, please. Is um, this meant to be in contrast to looking for additional fields? In the theory, you want to assume that essentially we know the content of the theory, but it uh, something additional is changing rather than the content of the theory. Actually, it's really great um, that you asked this question because the question of what is the field content, how many bosons, how many uh, how many bosons, how many fermions do we have, and what energy scales are they at, is going to be absolutely crucial at the end. So you're really already anticipating where this talk is going. I'm not going to assume that we know already what fields there are. And I'm assuming instead that there may be more particles that we might discover if we build larger accelerators, for example. So I leave that open. And the, the, the main message at the end will be that the particle content, the field content, will actually determine um, the fate of the space-time as we go to higher energies, essentially because there's going to be a fermionic pressure that tries to make the space-time dimension larger, a bosonic pull that tries to make the space-time dimension smaller, and at any given energy scale, we have access to so many bosonic species, so many fermionic species, and so we have a balance between the two, and that determines the dimension of space-time. But as we go to higher energies, we might uncover that, oh, now we have access to more bosons, more fermions, and the balance between the two, the bosons and the fermions, the bosonic pull and the fermionic push, might be different, leading us to a representation with a different number of dimensions, or even no representation anymore. And it will all depend on the, on the field content. It's really great that you asked that question. It gave me an opportunity to already preview what's coming up. <clears throat> okay, so um, I will proceed in the following way. First, I will argue that matter and space-time can be described in the same way. There is a common denominator. Um, a, co a common material that it's all made of, so to speak, and that's information. Matter and space-time can be described information theoretically and in a very concrete way. Don't worry, this is not going to be speculative. It's just another way of looking at what we know anyway. Um, namely, I will argue that matter and space-time can be described in terms of correlation functions. Um, and correlation functions are the building blocks of information theory. Okay, and then I will argue that 
once we formulated matter and space-time in terms of correlation functions, we can view these correlation functions, which are basically just the endpoint correlators of quantum field theory in the curved space-time. We can view these correlation functions as, as a representation of a more abstract algebraic structure. And then we'll study that algebraic structure and we will find that depending on the energy scale, this structure can have different dimensional space-time representations or even no space-time representation. And it will depend on the balance of bosonic pull and fermionic push. But overall, the message then is that the physical question as to the emergence of space-time is equivalent to the mathematical uh, framework uh, or question, how can representations emerge of an abstract structure? Okay, that's just a preview, an overview, a framework of um, what will happen. So I was claiming that matter can be described information theoretically, and that's really no big deal. Um, uh, we just look at things a little differently. Namely, clearly, um, quantum field theory, and that means matter, uh, can be described and is being described in terms of endpoint correlation functions in quantum field theory. Now, <clears throat> um, that's no news, but the point I want to make is that that's an information theoretic description, ultimately, because the correlation functions are the building blocks of uh, information theory. And we could, at this point, once we see the description of matter, the standard model of particle physics information theoretically, we could then launch into an information theoretic investigation of it. And with my group, I'm actually doing this. So for example, we can look at the interactions in quantum field theory, which are usually being looked at as exchanges of energy, momentum, and other quantum numbers. But we can also consider interactions in quantum field theory as exchanges of information, as exchanges of classical information and exchanges of quantum information. We can use quantum field theoretical interactions to transmit information. In fact, there is no other way because everything in the world is described by quantum field theory and therefore also you know, the internet and all of that. Of course, we are using quantum field theory to transmit information, but we can look at the, the elementary version of this. We can ask for every vertex in quantum field theory. How capable is it of transmitting classical information? How capable is it of transmitting quantum information? And by transmitting quantum information, I mean transmitting entanglement, right? So you have, for example, two particles, A and B, and let's say A was pre-entangled with some ancilla system. I mean, pre-entangled means before the interaction, it was entangled with some ancilla. And now A and B are interacting, some vertex plays out. And then afterwards I can ask, okay, A used to be entangled with A tilde. Is it still entangled with A tilde or did it hand over its entanglement to B in the interaction? And you can ask, you know, what's the efficiency of that? What is the quantum channel capacity? And so one of the things we're interested in in my group is to study particle physics information theoretically, um, to describe vertices and propagators in terms of the flow of classical and quantum information, the transmission of classical information and entanglement, that is. And um, one of the challenges I'm trying to address is the question whether all the Feynman rules are entirely describable in terms of classical and quantum channel capacities. So can we you know, just abandon talking about uh, momenta, energies, and other quantum numbers? Maybe it could all be described in terms of quantum channels. That would be nice because we have a whole theory of quantum channels independently of that. But that's, I mean, we know, already know that everything is information theoretic because correlation functions are information theoretic. I'm just asking whether we can reduce it to classical and quantum channel capacities. But that's not the subject of my talk today. Let me move on to the second claim, namely that space-time curvature itself also can be described information theoretically. That might be less known. 
So here's the second observation that we will use, namely that space-time is also describable through correlators. This is a result that came out of my teaching of quantum field theory a few years back in 2016, when um, I was raising that question in class and then some students picked up the question and said, let's work on it. So then I worked with those grad students on this and we figured it out that it can actually be done. Um, so this is um, an observation in that paper where I have the reference here at the bottom of the page. What we showed there is that if you know the propagator of a quantum field theory, in this case, a scalar one, on a curved space-time, and here is the propagator, it's the capital G2 on the right-hand side here, that's just the propagator next to Y, and it doesn't actually matter whether it's the Feynman propagator or retarded or advanced propagator and so on, any one of the propagators will do. If you have such a propagator, then you can calculate the metric from it. So the so two you, you are you are just reading it up from the same world things world function of place. Like, yes, that's right. It's correct. very similar to that. And the reason is yes, one way to see why that works is that the propagator has an expansion in terms of the singe world function close to the coincidence limit, and in or the metric, it describes only infinitesimal space-time distances. And for that, we can use the fact that the propagator has this expansion and therefore we obtain this. That's right, that's exactly, um, that's exactly right, that's how it works. Another way of looking at it is this. You may remember the result of Hawking and Penrose, which says that if you know the light cones um, everywhere on a space-time manifold, then you can reconstruct the metric from that. Just from knowing what the light cones are, you can reconstruct the metric up to a scalar, up to a, um, a conformal prefactor function. And what we showed is that, yeah, you, you also get the conformal prefactor function. So that's the formula for that. It means that um, if you're just given the Feynman rules, you can determine the metric from that, which is interesting conceptually, I think, because what it means is that in order to measure out the space-time, in order to measure what the curvature is, you don't need rulers and clocks as a matter of principle. You could instead just measure the propagator. And how do you measure a propagator? How do you measure Feynman rules? Well, you build a CERN. You build an accelerator. An accelerator can be viewed as a as a machine to test potential Feynman rules. So you could, in principle, measure uh, the correlation function by measuring you know, the propagation of particles. And um, if, this, if the curvature is significant enough, then the measurement instruments will pick up on that in the propagator. And then from the propagator, you can get the metric. So there is a way to get the metric from the quantum noise in, uh, in the space time the quantum noise of, of fields, the quantum fluctuations of fields, because that's what the propagator describes. So overall, the message here is that space times are expressible as usual in terms of a differentiable manifold and a metric on it, but also as a differentiable manifold and a two-point correlation function on it. That's an equivalent description. For us, important now is that it's a description in terms of a two-point correlation function, and therefore, in the same way that we describe the dynamics of matter as well. It's just correlators. Okay, so um, yeah, that was work with Mehdi Sarawani and Siyavash Aslanbeyi. Summary so far. What we saw is that both matter and space-time are expressible through the endpoint correlation functions. The endpoint correlation functions not only contain all the information about what the matter does, if you know these correlation functions, the, met the knowledge of the metric is already implied because from the two-point correlator, we can directly con reconstruct what the metric is. Now, Remember what the mission is. Our mission here is to try to find an abstract structure of which quantum field theory on a curved space-time is a concrete representation. Now, so far we've expressed 
matter and space time in terms of endpoint correlation functions. But these correlation functions depend on space time coordinates. This, of course, assumes that there is a differentiable space time manifold to start with. It, it assumes that there is some sort of manifold to build this on. But that's not what we wanted. We wanted space time to be part of the business of representing an abstract structure. The abstract structure should not contain any reference to the existence of a space time. The existence of, of a space time should be visible in the representation. So can we find a more abstract, coordinate free formulation of what we found? Can we find an abstract formulation of the fact that space, time, and matter can be expressed in terms of correlation functions. Well, we can do that. And let's, um, let's remember how this works in quantum mechanics, just ordinary first quantization quantum mechanics. Well, in quantum mechanics, when we have a two-point function, a correlation function, Green's function, g of x and x prime, it's a concrete function of two arguments. You know, space-time coordinates, uh, initial space-time coordinates, final space-time coordinates. But actually, in quantum mechanics, we can easily see that the Green's function is nothing but a position space representation of the time evolution operator. And the time evolution operator is an abstract operator in the Hilbert space. It does not refer to the existence of space and time or anything. The time evolution operator is just a unitary. It's just a unitary operator. And so the Green's function is a space-time representation of an operator, an abstract Hilbert space operator. Now here, we have not just one Green's function. We have the endpoint correlation functions, which generalize that picture of having a Green's function. And these endpoint correlation functions, again, are a space-time representation of something, namely of an operator, just like the Green's function is a concrete representation of an abstract operator on Hilbert space, and an operator, that is, which has two arguments, two vectors, right? We can take the unitary time evolution operator and slap a vector to the left and slap a vector to the right. Um, and similarly, we now have here in quantum field theory that these endpoint correlators can also be written not only in the position representation, just like in first quantization, they can be written in the momentum representation as well, and in many other representations too. We don't just have Fourier transforms available, we can choose any change of basis in the Hilbert space of functions on the space time. And we get another representation of our Green's functions here, of our correlation functions. Or we can say, well, they are all representations of one thing. They're all representations, the, the position space Green's function, the momentum space uh, Green's functions, and so on. They're all just representations of an abstract operator. I mean, each G <laughs> is, is a representation of an abstract operator. It's just on Hilbert space, on the Hilbert space of square integrable functions or square integrable fields on the manifold. So they are all just concrete representations of an abstract operator. It's just that these operators are operators with n arguments rather than just two arguments, because we want to include the vertices, of course. So that means that we can lift the description of quantum field theory on curved space-time of matter and space-time. We can lift that um, to a bunch of abstract operators which have these Green's functions as their representations. So the conjecture here that is that we should perhaps work with these Gn now without arguments spelled out, because this G superscript n are just abstract operators in Hilbert space. And then depending on which basis we choose, they become concrete functions. But if you don't choose a representation, they are not functions. So in this way, um, we could get a coordinate-free description of quantum field theory on curved space-time, a description that doesn't presume the existence of a space-time to start with. It would be just a bunch of operators. 
So can we get away with that? Could the GN, just these abstract operators, whose representation is the Green's functions, be the underlying abstract structure that we were looking for, an abstract structure that at different energy scales might have different representations and maybe at the Planck scale doesn't have a representation in terms of a space-time anymore. So to start with, we have to address the question whether when we go from the concrete Green's functions to the abstract operators GN, are we losing something or do we still have all the information together? That's a non-trivial question. Let me explain <clears throat> why. So um, in, in, in quantum mechanics, if we lift the concrete Green's function to an abstract time evolution operator, then we can go back to the concrete representation later simply by choosing the position representation. Then we obtain the position Green's function again. In quantum mechanics, we know how to do that because in quantum mechanics, if we describe everything in terms of abstract operators, such as the time evolution operator, the position and the momentum operators, then we know how to get the position representation. We simply diagonalize the position operator and that gives us the position basis well, and then we write the time evolution operator in the position basis, and that's the Green's function. But in quantum field theory, we don't have position operators. So if we lift our Green's functions to these abstract Hilbert space operators, we have to ask, good, we, now we have these abstract Hilbert space operators, but we don't have position operators anymore. How can we find our position representations again. If we do find the position representations again, if we find positional eigenbases again, well, then we are in business. Then we get the endpoint correlation functions back of quantum field theory. And from the two-point function, we even get the metric. So we have everything. But how do we get the position representation if all we are given is the abstract operators, just the abstract G superscript N? in the absence of position operators. And here, fortunately, in quantum field theory, we can still do it. It's just utterly different. And that's because in quantum field theory, we don't have position operators, but we do have vertices. And these vertices are local for reasons that I don't know, I don't know if everybody knows, but all of our interactions seem to be local interactions. And that comes to the rescue now, because the fact that the interactions in quantum field theory are local means that we can take any, let's say the three point correlator, we can take any higher point correlator and ask, I mean, just the abstract one, right? And we can ask in what basis in the Hilbert space is my vertex diagonal? Well, whatever basis the vertex is diagonal in is a position basis because the vertices are diagonal only in position space. The vertex, the, uh, a three or four or n vertex in quantum field theory is not diagonal in the momentum representation. It's diagonal only in the position representation and that expresses exactly locality. So as long as we're dealing with local quantum field theories, it is true that we can lift the concrete correlation functions to abstract operators and just deal with the abstract operators. And then whenever we want, we can come back to the position representation of these abstract correlators in terms of concrete correlation functions on, uh, in some coordinate system from which we can then also recover the metric. And the reason why we can do that is that we can diagonalize operators, in particular, a three vertex, for example, or a four vertex. <clears throat> so that means we establish that we're not losing anything by going from the um, correlation functions to the abstract correlators, which are viewed as just operators. So just like in ordinary first quantized Schrodinger theory, we can <coughs> describe things in a position representation or any other representation or also abstractly just as operators. 
And the abstract, the abstract the description of the theory, that's what we were after, after all, because the abstract one doesn't intrinsically presume that there is a position representation. We are no longer necessarily assuming that, for example, all the vertices are diagonalizable. And you would get a non-local theory if you find that your abstract correlators are, for example, not all diagonalizable. I mean, the, the endpoint functions, the um, for n larger than two, the vertices, if they're not all diagonalizable, then you would have a non-local theory. So, um, oh, I already said that it works, but here it is on a slide again. So, um, if we are just to quickly uh, recapitulate, what I'm saying is that if we lift the abstract, if we lift the concrete correlation functions to abstract operators, then we can recover the position representation uh, as long as the theory is local. If the theory is local, then we can diagonalize any um, higher point correlator, like a three or four vertex. That gives us a coordinate system. And then in that coordinate system, we can calculate, for example, the metric. And so we get the full space-time representation. So that's the step <laughs> that goes from the abstract to the concrete. That goes from the abstract structure to a concrete representation of the abstract structure in terms of quantum field theoretical correlators on a curved space-time. By the way, this proves that spectral geometry can be repaired. You may have heard of spectral geometry, or you probably have heard of it. It goes back to Hermann Weyl of 100 years ago, 120 years ago, actually. I think it was, uh, it was 1904, 1905, and Hermann Weyl said, can you hear um, the shape of objects? Um, Kutch later asked, you know, can you hear the shape of a drum? But in general, the question is, can you tell from the spectrum of something, um, from the spectrum of its vibrations, if you take um, something ceramic and you tap it, then you get a certain sound and you spectrally decompose it and then you have these frequencies and you can ask from those frequencies, can you tell the shape of the object that you are hearing? And the answer is no. In general, no. There is not enough um, uh, there is not enough information in the spectrum. However, imagine that you have an object whose shape you want to determine um, just from the sound of it. Now, imagine you tap it so hard that the oscillations become nonlinear. That changes the spectrum. Now, to make the, the oscillations nonlinear, means that you go into the regime where the vertices matter, because the vertices in the quantum field theory describe the nonlinearities of the theory. No vertices, the theory is free. With vertices, there are nonlinearities, and you engage them by exciting the field strongly enough. And what we see here is that you can go from the abstract operators to the concrete metric even, if you have vertices. So that means that if you have a nonlinear drum or some other object that you can excite so much that you can hear the change of the spectrum of vibration um, with the level of excitation that, that you excited, then um, you can actually recover the shape completely. It doesn't even depend on the dimension that we work in. But it's just a, a side comment there. I find spectral geometry very cool because of the following consideration. Um, and um, um, yeah, the, the, the consideration is this. The shape of an object is described by differential geometry, the mathematics of general relativity. The sound of the, that the object makes when vibrating is described in terms of spectra. That is, to say, that is to say, in terms of the mathematics of functional analysis, which is the mathematics of quantum theory. So spectral geometry that relates the sound of objects to the shape that they have is a mathematical bridge between the math of quantum theory and the math of general relativity. That's why I think um, spectral geometry is so cool. Um, and, and also, uh, yes, I mean, I have published on, on that um, subject. So, so uh, it's not clear to me that you are getting around uh, the need for the for something like con spectral triple by that. Your example just uh, was essentially the same example as the Laplacian. 
If, if you go, if I only give you the two point function, no matter how loud I'm going to beat it, it isn't going to help. That's right. That's why I'm using it. Yes, exactly correct. But remember, I'm using the three point function too. I'm using but, the three. And but four we know we we know that if you specify certain quantum field theories, they won't be sufficient to uh, even though you've given the, the two point function, they won't be sufficient to specify a unique geometry. That's correct. But if you have the three point function, you can diagonalize in the position representation, and then you get the two point function, not abstractly, not just the spectrum of it, you get the two point function in the position representation. And if but you it, it, it depends, it depends on the theory in, in, in a rather detailed way, whether how much you, no, information no, no, you can get out. No, no, the point is that if you have a three point function that's local, then you get a position representation. And if you have a position representation, then you get the two point correlation function concretely in terms of X and Y positions. And then you can use that formula to get the metric explicitly. But that formula that you've written there just relies on the Laplacian. Yes, but it's it's true always. You see, it's the thing is this, you can get from the two point function, you can get the metric. The trick is how do you get the two point function? You see, in spectral geometry, you don't give yourself the two-point function. What you give yourself is the spectrum of the two-point function. If you have the two-point function itself as a function of x and y, then this formula gives you the metric. So the question is, how do you get from the, just the spectrum of the two-point function, the actual two-point function itself as a function? And you can do that if you know where in the Hilbert space the position bases are. And you can find out where the position bases are by diagonalizing the three and four point functions, right? So that's the trick there. That's how the nonlinearity helps. Because from the nonlinearity, you can turn your abstract operators into concrete position space operators, the Green's functions. And once you have the two point function, then you get the metric in this way. But let me please uh, continue, otherwise we should, I won't be able to, to get through it all. Um, okay, uh, where, are, where are we now? <laughs> right, that's that. Okay, good. So then um, the question arises, now that we can describe uh, space, time, and matter in terms of these just abstract operators on the Hilbert space, and um, so you have these abstract operators. It's not a spectral triple. What you have is just the abstract operators, um, uh, the lifted uh, Green's functions, the, the lifted endpoint functions. Um, you can recover your space time and you recover um, the, the quantum field theory simply by going back to position representation. You diagonalize your uh, vertices and that gives you um, uh, a position basis in the Hilbert space. And in this way, you get everything in terms of position space. And then from that, you can get the metric, right? However, however, the thing is that if you're given, if, if you work with abstract operators G superscript N in the Hilbert space, there is a priori no reason that the vertices are diagonalizable or approximately diagonalizable, which means that just because you have a bunch of these operators doesn't mean that they have a representation in terms of quantum field theories on a curved space time. No, for that, it takes something. It takes that the vertices are simultaneously diagonalizable, which is the case for the standard model of particle physics, all the vertices are, diagonal in the same bases uh, in the Hilbert space, but in general, that's not guaranteed. So clearly, this abstract structure definitely allows um, situations where it cannot be represented on, on a curved space, uh, as quantum field theories on a curved space time at all. Um, so what we could have is that in low energy regimes, such as the energies that we are operating in uh, nowadays, the abstract GN operators um, may well be uh, approximately diagonalizable. I mean, they are, we know that because we have a representation of the physics 
in terms of quantum field theoretical endpoint function on a curved space times. But there's no guarantee that the underlying abstract structure does possess, even at high energies, um, a representation as quantum field theoretical correlators on a curved space time. It could be that the representation that I've been talking about is an approximate one. It could be that the underlying structure really is such that the GN for n larger than two are not really simultaneously all diagonalizable, exactly diagonalizable. And what would it mean if they were, let's say, approximately diagonalizable? Well, that would mean that the interactions are approximately local. And it could also be that at low energies, they would appear to be very accurately diagonalizable. At high energies, not so much. Or they could be diagonalizable, but only in the, to, to give us representations at a different space-time dimension. So these things are what I want to uh, study next now in, in a very concrete example, just to boil this down from the abstract to something more concrete. Uh, oh, okay, a summary slide so far. So summary so far, space, time, and matter are describable by a collection of abstract endpoint correlators. And in principle, yes, I wanted to make that point. In principle, the set of all representations, even at just one energy scale, the set of all the representations could include more than just changes of coordinate system. It could also include, for example, quantum reference frames and dualities such as ADS-CFT, where you have the same physics describable in different ways, perhaps even in um, on, on space-time manifolds of different uh, dimensions, uh, different amounts of curvature. All right, so um, generic GN are at best approximately representable as quantum field theoretical correlators on a space-time manifold because they are at best diagonalizable um, approximately. There is no reason why all of the endpoint functions ought to be diagonalizable in the same basis. So in particular, there could be regimes in which these abstract correlators simply do not possess a representation um, in terms of uh, quantum fields that live on a curved space-time. So in this way, quantum field theory in curved space-time could be an approximate representation of a more fundamental abstract structure of endpoint correlators in a theory that's fundamentally not geometric. It fundamentally has nothing to do with geometry. It just happens to have representations in terms of quantum field theories on a curved space time in one or several regimes. I mean, energy regimes. So how could we develop then a theory of these abstract operators GN? Well, all of the GN, together, bunched together into just the partition function, right? Because we know that all the endpoint correlators of quantum field theory can be obtained by functional differentiation of the partition function of quantum field theory. So there's a convenient way of describing the whole bunch. We just have a function of J, of the Schwinger sources. So basically everything is encoded in one function. It's the partition function. And now there are two ways to do this. One way to do it would be to say, and we will pursue this uh, in the subsequent slides, one way would be to say, well, we just do it traditionally. We say that the partition function is a path integral. Actually, I like to think of it as a Fourier transform. I don't know if everybody is aware of this, but quantization is a Fourier transform, right? So here you have the classical action, S of phi, and then before you transform it, right? Here's the classical action S of phi, and then e to the power integral j phi. What is that? That's a Fourier factor. In fact, it's infinitely many Fourier factors. It's one for every x, right? It's a functional Fourier transform. The partition function is nothing but the functional Fourier transform of the classical action. So it's it's equivalent, right? We can we can go from the partition function to the classical action and vice versa, no problem. And we can study, therefore, the theory of the GN um, either on this side as a partition function or on that side 
to doing it the traditional way, viewing it um, as, uh, as a path integral, where, of course, in order to make these things abstract, all we need to do is take that integral and view it as an inner product of a vector j and a vector phi. And then the whole thing becomes representation independent. So that's what we will do in the subsequent slides. But before we do that, I'd like to remind you that we could also do everything right here. And that's fundamentally what I actually prefer to do, but it's a bit more outlandish. And you see, if we work here with the Z of J, then what we're working with is endpoint correlation functions. And as I mentioned before, the correlation functions are the building blocks of information theory. So on the right-hand side, we have traditional physics. On the left-hand side, the partition function, that is information theory. Why? Well, let's look at what is an endpoint correlation function. If n is equal to one, the endpoint correlation function for n equal to one is a probability distribution. And um, for probability distributions, we have von Neumann entropies, Renyi entropies, you know, we know how to study probability distributions. Now for n equal to, what is a correlation function, an endpoint correlation function for n equal to two? Well, we study that in information theory. Um, it gives us mutual information, coherent information, classical and quantum channel capacities, logarithmic negativity as measures of entanglement, and all of that. It's all encoded in the n equal to two correlation functions. And then we have also n equal three, n equal four, and possibly higher order correlation functions. And they just give us multipartite entanglement and a whole higher order web of informational relationships. The point I want to make is that this is described naturally. The left-hand side is described naturally information theoretically. The right-hand side, we are much more familiar with. That's the physical uh, way to do this. And um, in order not to go too outlandish, I will do the next slides here on the right-hand side, so just traditional uh, path integral. So, um, oh, before we do that, uh, I wanted to just um, make a philosophical comment. Why should information theory be so fundamental? Why could it? Why would it play such an important role in physics after all? Isn't information theory for engineers? Well, I think the point here is that the notion of information is just so much more robust than the notion of energy, the notion of distance in space or time and so on, or the notion of weight. Um, the notion of information is just more robust because it is applicable even in the most counterintuitive regimes, even when physical notions such as distance, curvature, mass, length, and so on fail, for example, the Planck scale, we cannot imagine having a ruler or a ticking clock at, uh, at the Planck scale. It just makes no sense. But even in such counterintuitive situations, we can always ask, all right, how much information do I need? How many bits and qubits do I need to describe uh, the situation going in? And how, how many bits and qubits do I need to describe the situation going out and so on? The, the bits and qubits are just so much more robust because they are agnostic as to the methods with which they are obtained. <clears throat> so maybe information is the basic currency of physical processes. And, and if so, then it would seem natural that we study correlation functions because, as we saw here, correlation functions are the building blocks of information and of quantum information. All right, so then a concrete example. Let's just calculate something ex completely explicitly. Um, and for that, um, let's look at a theory in which we have a bunch of free boson fields and free fermion fields and gravity. So this is a very simplified theory that I'm going to um, calculate through now. It's a theory in which we have boson species, in which we have fermion species. The whole thing is with the Euclidean signature, not the Lorentzian signature. And I'm not considering any interactions between the bosons and the fermions. So the only interaction is with gravity. So bosons and fermions gravitate, but they don't interact directly with each other. So it's a Euclidean free boson, free fermion theory. That's, that's all. It's a very modest um, uh, theory. And of course, I picked it this way because that's a theory that you can actually calculate through completely. You don't need perturbation theory for that one. You can do this completely. So the, uh, what we will do 
is, and, and this is based on the PRL that I wrote with uh, two fantastic postdocs, Markus Reitz and Barbara Schroeder. Um, um, so what we will do is we will take this theory of free bosons and free fermions, Lorenz, uh, Euclidean signature um, with, with gravity, and we will lift it. We will lift it from a space-time representation to this abstract representation, um, to this abstract formulation. And then in the abstract formulation, we will calculate the whole thing through and ask, well, does it have other regimes too? Could it be that <clears throat> there are re regimes in which this theory is representable with a certain number of space-time dimensions and then regimes in which it is representable with a different number of space-time dimensions? And maybe there are representations and maybe there are regimes where there are no space-time representations. And that's <clears throat> that's what, what we are aiming at here. <laughs> so let's start with the path integral for bosons. Let's say we have uh, NB bosons. So capital N subscript B is the number of bosons that we have. And then the action, it's, it's just a massive Klein-Gordon Klein action, can be written in this way, basis independently. Where these are not quantum states, these Kets and Bras, this is just a, um, a Ket Bra representation, a Ket Bra notation for the abstract fields in the Hilbert space of fields on the manifold. So if we choose now, for example, a position basis, uh, then we can spell out what the trace is, and we recover the usual integral, we recover the usual Klein-Gordon action. This is just how you can write the Klein-Gordon action um, basis independently. There's no big deal, it's just functional analysis. We could also use a momentum basis here, and then the whole thing would become the Klein-Gordon action in momentum space. But in this way, we are not assuming, but in this basis independent way, we are not even assuming anymore that there is a position basis. And that's of course important because we want to free ourselves from that assumption. Actually, working with uh, in a basis independent way is good and fine, but it will actually be useful to, to use a particular basis for practical calculations. And a basis that we always have available is the eigenbasis of the wave operator. You can always diagonalize the, this operator here. And if we do that, then the bosonic action becomes this action here, where I forgot the prefactor of one half. Um, so this is the phi i n are the eigen vectors of the wave operator Laplace and plus m squared, and the lambda n are the eigenvalues of the wave operator. And so here we have the sum over all of the eigenvalues. The eigenvalues are enumerated lambda n, and we have the sum over all boson species as well. Okay, so that's just a trivial way of rewriting the Klein-Gordon action in the eigenbasis of the wave operator. And we are assuming here that all of the bosons have the same mass. Later, we will free ourselves from that assumption. I will just keep it simple here by keeping all the masses the same. And in exactly the same way, we can also write the fermionic action if we have n subscript f fermion species, in terms of the eigenbasis of effectively the square root of the wave operator, the Dirac operator, and we get the square root of these eigenvalues here, and these are Brassman variables for the fermions. And the point of using the eigenbasis of the wave operator here is that we are no longer assuming then that the position basis even exists. And we assume for simplicity that the fermions also have the same mass. Again, later we will free ourselves from that constraint. It's just to keep things simple here. So then we have the bosons, we have the fermions in a, written in a way that no longer assumes that there's a position representation. Now, how can we write down the, the gravity action? Gravity action. Oh, I think, oh, there's, I think there is. there's an echo now. Uh, yes. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, here we can use a fantastically beautiful result by Hawking and Gilkey. Hawking and Gilkey showed that when you have uh, a Euclidean 
theory and you put an ultraviolet cutoff on it. And from now on, we will assume an ultraviolet cutoff. We can later remove that if we want to, but for now let's assume an ultraviolet cutoff. We might imagine it to be chosen to be at the Planck scale to model a natural ultraviolet cutoff, for example. But the, math the mathematics of it is agnostic about it. Let's just assume we have a natural, uh, we just have an ultraviolet cutoff lambda bar. Um, in Euclidean space. And then Hawking and Gilkey have this beautiful result that says that the number of eigenvalues of the Laplacian below the ultraviolet cutoff, this number n of eigenvalues, has an expansion in terms of the curvature, which begins with the Einstein Hilbert action. It's a constant term plus. Uh, a term multiplying the Ricci scalar plus higher order curvature terms. In practice, this term is very much suppressed as usual. And in practice, this term is very much too large by 122 orders of magnitude. It's the usual mismatch between the cosmological constant that we see and the cosmological constant that we expect. That would be a cosmological constant that would be way too large. But in any case, this is just mathematics. It says that the Einstein action with an admittedly much too large cosmological constant um, uh, can be written as the number of eigenvalues below the cutoff, um, the number of eigenvalues of the Laplacian and therefore of the wave operators below the cutoff. And this means that we can write except I mean, up to corrections, higher order corrections, which for which we have no experimental evidence for, up to such corrections, we can write the action, the gravitational action, in a super duper elegant way. Because what Hawking and Gilkey provide us here with is a way to describe this action as the number of eigenvalues of the wave operator below the cutoff. So the gravity action can be written as a number mu times the number of eigenvalues below the cutoff, where the number mu is six pi over the cutoff, just so that you get the actual gravity action here. If you combine the lambda bar over six with the one over 16 pi squared, that's what you need. And the number of eigenvalues below the cutoff in an ultraviolet cutoff theory is simply the trace of the identity operator. Right? The trace of the identity operator is the dimension of the Hilbert space, which is the number of eigenvalues of any self-adjoint operator, such as the number operator. So what that means is this. Um, we can write the Klein-Gordon action as a trace. We can write any action as a trace in order to make it um, basis independent, in order to make it independent of choosing a position representative or any other representation. We can write any action as a trace, such as the Klein-Gordon action here. We wrote it as a trace. And now we see, using Hawking and Gilkey's result, we can write the gravity action as a trace too, but it's so incredibly simple. It's just a leading constant. It's just the trace of one. I mean, mu times one. So you can view this as saying that the action of a quantum field theory plus gravity is simply a trace where the first term is a constant. It's a, it's a constant times the identity operator plus higher order stuff, which describes then the matter, but the, the leading constant is just gravity. Okay, so we can now write by combining the bosonic action and the fermionic action and the gravity action, we can now write a simple partition function here, a simple path integral where we integrate over the boson fields, all species, over the fermion fields, all species of them. And the integration over gravity now is the integration over our description of gravity. The description of gravity now is in terms of the eigenvalues of the wave operator and in terms of the number of eigenvalues. The number of eigenvalues below the cutoff could be any number. And then for whatever number it is, we have an integral over all possible eigenvalue combinations over all spectra. And for that, we will integrate over all possible lambda values from the lowest eigenvalue that the wave operator could have, m squared, up to the cutoff. If we simply integrate over all eigenvalues of the wave operator, then we get 
every spectrum multiple times because we are not ordering the eigenvalues. And for that, we have to divide by n minus one factorial so that we path integrate only over every spectrum once. This factor here looks a little ugly, but we can get rid of it. This is just there to make the units right. Lambda is the ultraviolet cutoff. And if we choose units such that this lambda is one, then that entire term just disappears. And so we just have this clean path integral e to the power minus beta s. S is the action of fermions, bosons, and gravity. Now, the advantage of neglecting brutally all of the interactions between the bosons and the fermions is that this theory can be completely calculated through. And what do we get? Oh, here we go. Just a sec. Right. What we get is that the partition function can be expressed in terms of this expression here, where the C is this expression. The details don't matter at all. Um, the only thing to take away from these expressions here is from these four equations is that it can be done. Um, th these integrals can be done. What you need to do is um, you have two types of Gaussian integrals. You have a bosonic Gaussian integral for every bosonic species, a fermionic Gaussian integral for every fermionic species. You have to integrate over all of the spectra, and you have to do an infinite sum over the possible number of eigenvalues that you might have below the threshold. And all of that luckily can just, it just so happens that all of this can be done analytically, and that's what you get. So in this case, um, once we have the partition function, in principle, of course, we can calculate everything. And so in particular, we can now try to calculate what the dimension is of space-time. And we can calculate also, you know, what would be the volume of the space-time and other uh, quantities here. What we cannot calculate, unfortunately, is the metric itself of any such space-time. And the reason is that in order to be able to calculate everything through completely, we had to neglect the vertices, right? We, we do not have interactions between the boson, among the bosons and the fermions, which means that we don't have vertices. If we had vertices, and that's the project that we are working on now, if we had vertices, we could diagonalize them and then find the position representations from which we can let, get the metric. But in this case here, we neglected the interactions, um, which is, of course, very crude. But if we neglect them, then the one advantage is that we can calculate the whole thing. But the disadvantage is we can't get the metric. So how can we get the at least the dimension of the space-time then? Now, in order to get the dimension of the space-time, we can use Weil scaling. You see, Hermann Weil discovered 100 years ago or so, more than 100 years ago, that when you have um, a problem of a Laplacian, and um, so you have, uh, you, you, diag you diagonalize the Laplacian on a manifold, then uh, you can ask, what are the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian? And the eigenfunctions are initially always dominated, the behavior of the eigenfunctions, it depends on the shape of the manifold. But Weil discovered that if you go to sufficiently high eigenvalues, then the eigenvectors are no longer determined, the eigenfunctions are no longer so much determined by the curvature of the manifold. No, the eigenfunctions are determined by the dimension of the manifold. And that's simply the statement that in the ultraviolet, infrared curvature doesn't matter. So Hermann Weil discovered that the spectrum of a wave operator at large eigenvalues tells us what the dimension is of the manifold. That's the famous Weil scaling. And so what um, Weil found is that the density of that the density of eigenvalues rho of lambda scales with lambda as dimension of the manifold half minus one. So if you have a representation of your wave operator, uh, if you have a representation of an operator as a wave operator on a, a manifold, then the scaling of the eigenvalues tells you the dimension of that manifold. 
Now, what we can do now that we have the partition function of our theory, admittedly a simple theory, but we have the partition function of it, is that we can calculate what that density of eigenvalues is. And when we calculate what that density of eigenvalues is, we find that it depends on the number of fermionic species and the number of bosonic species that we have in the theory. And then we can compare. We can compare the scaling that we find for the theory of free bosons, free fermions on the curved background, where we pass in the grade over everything, the bosons, the fermions, and the gravity, then we find that this is the scaling of the density of eigenvalues, and it's dependent on the number of boson and fermion species. And when you compare that with Weyl scaling, we can read off what the dimension of the spacetime has to be has to be arising from this theory here. And we find that the dimension discovered through the Weyl uh, scaling is two plus the number of fermions minus the number of boson species. And that's what I was referring to early on, namely that the more fermion species you have, the larger the dimension of the spacetime tends to be. The more boson species you have, the smaller the number of dimensions of the spacetime needs to be. Hence, there is kind of a fermionic push that's normally fermionic push means particles are being pushed apart. But uh, because of Pauli exclusion, right? But here, what we see is that the number of fermion species is trying to make the dimension of space time larger. And the number of boson species is, is sort of a bosonic pull. It tries to make the dimension of space time smaller. But remember that so far, what we did is we assumed that all the bosons, all the fermions have the same mass. But in reality, of course, they don't. And so what we can do is we can now consider the situation where um, the bosons and the fermions have different masses. So you have some light, some heavy bosons, some light, some heavy, some medium heavy fermions, and so on. And then you can repeat this exercise that we just did, and you can find out what the effective dimension of space-time is as a function of the energy scale. And the reason is that depending on what energy scale you're operating on, you see different numbers of species of particles. At low energies, like the ones that we can have currently have access to, we have a certain standard model, model of particles, so many bosons, so many fermions. But at higher energies, who knows? We might find that more bosons and more fermions pop up. And if they do, that would they would enter into that calculation of the effective dimension. And here's a simple example. Let's say we have 32 fermion species and 30 boson species at low energies, just numbers pulled out of the hat. If we had 32 fermion and 30 boson species, then according to this formula, right, the effective dimension of the space-time is 2 plus fermion minus boson species. In this case, that's a two, and then the difference between those two is two, so it would be four. That would make for a four-dimensional space-time at low dimensions. And then at higher dimensions, let's say at, at medium energies, um, another fermion species becomes visible, and another three boson species become visible. Well, now the balance changes because now we have effectively two more boson species and that reduces the dimension then by two to two. So there would be a regime, an energy regime, where we would go through having uh, three dimensions and then two dimensions. And there would be regimes in which that simply isn't a representation of the abstract theory in terms of uh, a quantum field theory that lives on a curved space-time, because the wild scaling would be off, right? If that theory had a representation in terms of a quantum field theory on a curved space-time, its wild scaling would have to correspond to a non-integer dimension. 
So what that means is that as you go to higher energy scales, you kind of boil up your so space time starts boiling, it becomes, you know, um, less and less representable as um, the, the abstract theory becomes less and less representable as a quantum field theory on a curved space time with a fixed dimension. And then it has a fixed dimension and again, and then it doesn't, and then it has again. And that process can repeat itself. There could be at even higher energies, one means the Planck energy here, and you know that would be very small energies here. Um, you could arrange simply by assuming that maybe there are more boson species coming, uh, becoming visible at high and higher energies, you could arrange a scenario where the effective dimension would drop to zero and even below which means there simply isn't a way in which this abstract theory could be represented as quantum field theories, uh, as quantum fields that live on a curved space time. So what we have here is an example of an abstract theory that at different energy, in different energy regimes can possess representations as quantum fields living on a curved space time in different energy regimes, the, the space times would have to have different dimensions. And you can also have a situation where in some energy regimes, there is just no way of representing the abstract theory as quantum fields that live on a curved space time at all. So the overall summary then is that we obtain dimensions and well, I didn't show it here, but in, if you read the paper with uh, Barbara Schroeder and Markus, uh, right, you will find that we we calculated more than just the dimension. For example, we also calculated the volumes of space times um, of these emergent space times for this um, theory, and um, we found that all of these depend on bosonic pull and fermionic pressure. We performed also several consistency checks just to see that this is not a fluke what we find there, but that you can find the same results about dimensions and volumes also from a different from a different approach. <clears throat> And we found that the, the balance of the bosonic pull and the fermionic pressure depends on the energy scale through the mass spectrum of particles. And in particular, <laughs> one of the things it would show is that the integer nature of the dimension of space-time, the reason why space-time dimensions are integer, would ultimately be reduced to the fact that the number of species has to be integer. Right? So the number of species of quantum field theoretical species of boson species and fermion species is always an integer naturally. And that's why the dimension of space time would always have to be integer as well, except for situations when there is no space time representation. So the conclusions then are um, quantum field theory on um, a curved space time can be viewed as an approximate representation of an of abstract theory of an abstract theory of endpoint correlators. And this gives us a theory that also contains pre-geometric or non-geometric regimes. And it could also be, and we haven't really explored that yet, that um, when you have a representation on uh, of your abstract theory as quantum fields living on a curved space time, it may not be unique you may have also a representation of the same theory as quantum fields living on another space time. And that could be a way to view um, duality, such as uh, the ADS-CFT duality or the use of quantum reference frames. Um, the abstract structure of endpoint correlators can be viewed as being information theoretic because correlation functions are the building blocks of information theory. And ultimately, what we're dealing with is just functions of n variables or operators of n variables. And as such, there is really no need to even consider them information theoretic. We could just say it's just structure. In any case, um, the message here is that the physics of the emergence of space time and matter could be the mathematics of the emergence of representability. Um, namely of representability of an abstract structure as quantum fields on a space-time manifold. Oof, I just noticed I am way over time here. I apologize, sorry for that, but uh, this is the end of the talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's, let's thank Akim. <laughs>
Thank you. Any questions? I always have questions, but <laughs> I wanted to give someone else a chance. Um, it wasn't clear to me why that your scaling definition was the right definition there, um, because that comes the, the scaling comes from just a single Laplacian operator or fermionic operator. You're mixing many of them together and integrating and then just trying to get the scaling from the partition function, the global partition function in the end. I don't know why that's the right. Well, yes, it's it's. Uh, well, what we do here is this: we have multiple wave operators because the uh, the bosons have uh, different masses and the fermions can have varying masses, but um, we have only one Laplace operator. So all the bosons would have wave operators that have the same uh, Laplace in, in them and therefore the same spectrum. And also the, the the Dirac operators for the fermions would all be the same Dirac operators, even they have even though they have um, different masses. And for simplicity, we are assuming here that the Dirac operator can be viewed as a square root of the Laplace operator. So that's how we perhaps somewhat artificially and simplifyingly um, get just one spectrum to work with. You, you also have access to the two point functions, should you wish, because uh, you put in a system of, uh, of free fields with free fields of two point functions. Yes, that's right. We do have the two point functions, but all we have about the two point function is their abstract description. But and... you could choose a representation because it won't, it oh, won't yeah, change yeah. any of the analysis that you have Absolutely. done. Absolutely. I oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we do choose a representation. We choose the representation in which the wave operator is diagonal. Because uh, choosing a representation is nice, because then you can um, perform explicit theories and integrals and all of that. I mean, that's ultimately why we choose representations. And we choose a representation. But what we cannot do is um, represent the two-point function in a position representation. Because when we are in the mode of working abstractly, then we have no means of finding the um, the uh, the position representations. Even when they exist, we don't have means to find them. And the reason is that we don't have the vertices in that theory. You could put in an infinitesimal vertex uh, and uh, treat it um, as such a sufficiently high enough order that it just gave you the... Uh, uh, That's what we are working on. The position. Yes, exactly. Absolutely. Well, then you then it will give you a, a particular representation of the Laplacian, and it won't coincide. I can you can easily construct an example where it won't coincide with the dimension that you want to get out from your scaling. Uh, first of all, we we are pursuing this, so we put interactions in there and then treat things perturbatively, and uh, that works because. We don't need to solve the theory explicitly with the interactions, so we can get away with it perturbatively because in order to diagonalize the vertex, we don't have to renormalize that vertex. We can just work with the Feynman rule there. But I don't understand um, um, uh, your claim here. Uh, are you saying that th that if we introduce a vertex and then um, diagonalize the vertex and then write the two-point function in that eigenbasis. And then from the two-point function, calculate the metric and therefore also discover the dimension of the space-time, that it may not be um, matching with the dimension that we get from wild scaling. It won't because uh, if I take the, just the two-point function for the, the scalar or the Laplacian, we know uh, from the Hagedown form that it's going to have that, that uh, uh, sing uh, that same fun world function that uh, you took the derivative of to get the metric, you, you know you can extract that from it. And you know also that the scaling of that uh, is, is tied to the, the spectrum. And it's essentially from that that Weyl's theorem comes, which, where you get the dimension. 
So, and you'll, you will get if you tick, if you start it out with a three dimensional theory, let's be a big three dimensional theory, and I can just put in uh, some scalar interaction as the only interaction. It's super normalizable, so I don't have to worry about the divergence of that. Um, then I, I, I will get a contradiction there. I didn't, I didn't understand that. Um, how do you construct the contradiction? I, I'm not getting that. I'm just picking an example where uh, the, where I know the interaction, and I want to take yeah. that interaction to be infinitesimally small, and so that yeah. I and I know the I know the basis in which it's it is uh, diagonal mm -hmm. to be the position basis of yeah. a particular curve space, and that I decide to to choose perhaps it's a yeah a nice sphere in your example of Sitter's Euclidianized Sitter space. Uh, and I can easily uh, construct the two-point function there. I know the scaling of that. I, and I, in the background, it's really a three-dimensional space all the way to arbitrary cutoff. But it, will it won't give the same scaling dimension as you've read out. I don't believe it will. Okay, so are you saying that Wilde's formula doesn't always apply? No, Wild's formula, Wild's formula applies, yes, they are. Well, okay, so uh, let me um, refine uh, the statement that I made. Maybe we- Maybe I'm missing that. something there, right? Okay, so um, assume that we have a position representation. In this case, we can get the the metric from differentiating the two-point correlation function. And um, from that, we will get not just the metric, we can also read of what the dimension is of the metric. And we can then also consider the while scaling and read off from that what the dimension is. And since the while scaling works, we will get the same dimension as I mean, it's just there's, there's just no contradiction, right? In this case, I'm, I'm getting to the case where there might be a contradiction. So, in this case, whenever everything is as usual and we have an ordinary space time representation of our Planck and field theory, so our abstract structure we are looking at in a regime where it has a representation as, a, as quantum fields living on a curved space time. In this case, you always get the same dimension of the space time, whether or not you use wide scale. But, but I, I, I can put in an arbitrary number of fermions as well here, and that will change your dimension. Yes. Whereas it won't change, it won't change the wide scaling dimension of the Laplacian. Oh, yeah, yeah. But remember, in this theory that I presented here, you don't get to fix the manifold and then put more or fewer fermions on it. Because that's a theory where the manifold is not fixed. We are, we are not having a, a curved space-time background on which we put more or less species of bosons and fermions. The path integral is over gravity too. It's not, we are, we, are, we are fixing the number of boson species or fixing the number of fermion species. And then we calculate what the space-time might be. Right? So you can't just choose the space-time and then, then change the the uh, the number of species you have on that. But let me get back to something that I have to be more careful on. Now that you said what you said, I think I have to be more careful on this. Um, when when we um, when we discussed in, in this presentation towards the end, the fact that oh my God, just a sec, uh, I have to see if I'm missing a meeting here. Oh, no, we're good, we're good. Um, right. When we are working with this abstract theory um, and we are asking, does it have a representation um, on a certain number of dimensions? Let's see, this curve, for example. What this curve is saying is that our abstract theory at, for example, this energy scale, can you see the, the mouse? Yeah, yes. Right. So, for example, at this energy scale, the while scaling indicates four dimensions. Strictly speaking, we have not proven that this theory has a representation in which uh, a representation uh, that 
at that energy scale where uh, in terms of quantum fields on a four-dimensional space-time. We have not proven that it has that. The only thing we've shown is that if it has one, the dimension has to be four. And similarly here in that regime, we have not proven that in that energy regime, the theory has a representation in terms of uh, quantum fields that live on a curved space-time of dimension two. The only thing we've shown is that if it does have a representation or multiple representations, they all have to be of dimension two, right? Because we only showed that if there's a representation, then while scaling should apply. And according to while scaling, the dimension uh, has to be such and such then. I will leave others ask questions just. Yep. Um, when you talked about the eigenfunctions of the um, Laplace, you know, the, um, the Klein-Gordon operator looking thing, um, and you spoke about that being dominated by dimension, mm -hmm. um, what type of case is this in terms of curvature? As in, if you were to then think about the specifics of the curvature on the manifold, um, how would this change things? Yes. So this uh, goes back to um, what we can already see in uh, in first quantization, just uh, the Schrodinger equation of, let's say, a free particle in, uh, in a box. Let's say we consider a, a particle in a box. Um, the scaling of its spectrum is going like n squared. So the eigenvalue for the n eigen uh, value is, is proportional to n squared, particle in a box. Now imagine that in the box, we actually have a potential. And um, that potential is so somewhat non-trivial. Then that means that the eigenfunctions are non-trivial and therefore the spectrum is no longer n squared. However, if we look at sufficiently large energies, um, so at for very large n, then the particle really doesn't see that potential anymore because it has that much of energy that the, the difference that the potential makes doesn't really affect the particle anymore. And that means that for large n, um, we get back to the n squared scaling. Um, now that's just the presence of a potential, but it's very similar to curvature. If you have the Laplace, in, I mean, the particle in the, in the, in the box is just, um, a free particle in a box is just Laplace in over 2m, the Hamiltonian, right? And if you have a potential, then it's Laplace in over 2m plus the potential. But if we can now do the same thing with curved space, where we look at the Laplacian, not Laplacian plus the potential, but the Laplacian modified by curvature. And then the same deal. Um, initially, um, the curvature will impact the wave functions, the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian, and therefore the spectrum. But as well noticed, when the wavelength of the eigenfunctions becomes smaller, significantly smaller, then the typical length of whatever curvature is on that space-time, then um, the wave functions become essentially the usual wave functions as if there were no scaling, uh, as if there were no curvature. And therefore, um, since the eigenfunctions approach the non-curvature eigenfunctions, the eigenvalues, uh, eigenvalues approach the non-curvature eigenvalues, and therefore the scaling becomes um, the no-curvature scaling. And the scaling is, of course, dependent on the dimension. Um, for example, if you have a, a particle in a box, then in one dimension, the spectrum, it goes like n squared, but in two dimensions, it goes like n1 squared plus n2 squared. And that gives us a different scaling, actually, and different degeneracies. And so similarly, um, in, with the curved space, we have a dimension-dependent um, uh, scaling of the 
eigenvalue of spectrum, the, 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 the distances between the eigenvalues. Is, is that answering your question? Yeah, yeah, that answers it. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, cool. Is that statement at all sensitive to the fact that you're working with a Euclidean signature? Yes, very much answer? so. Yes, very good question. Very much so. Um, it only works in the Euclidean um, in the Euclidean signature. Um, while scaling, uh, I don't know of any analog of while scaling for the Lorentzian signature. Um, you know, the wave operated, the, the Dynambertian really behaves very differently from the Laplacian. And so um, this means that, and, and we are working on this, when we when we work in the Lorentzian signature case, then we have to use different methods. It's a trade-off. The moment we go to Lorentzian signature, we can no longer use wild scaling, which is unfortunate. But when we go to the Lorentzian signature, we also introduce interactions. And once we have the interactions, we no longer need the wild scaling because then we, with the interactions, we can diagonalize, we can get the metric and then from that read off the dimension this way. But now that you say that, I think it would be a good idea to, to do the theory with the interactions perturbatively also in the Euclidean signature, because then it's, it provides yet another consistency check, because then we can do both. We can recover the dimension using wild scaling or not using the wild scaling, and it should be the same. Mm -hmm. Another question I had was, um, so when, when your framework sort of goes out of the regimes where we have something familiar, like a quantum field theory or even a space time, um, do we have a way of learning what that other thing looks like from your abstract? Yeah. Uh, that's, that's a very cool question. Yes, I was wondering about this. Um, it, it's one of the reasons why I kept um, going on and on about this being information theoretic um, with the correlators, because I think that's the closest we, we have to an interpretation then. We could say there's this abstract structure and we can view it as we can interpret it information theoretically as being about correlators. And sometimes, I mean, in some energy regimes, this web of correlators can be represented as quantum field theoretical correlators on a curved space time. And so we have an entire cosmology associated with that. Yes, so we have a reality with space and time and with matter fields on it and so on. Um, and then in, in other regimes, we may not have that. But in all regimes, we have the description as these abstract operators, these abstract correlation operators. And they can be viewed as being uh, information theoretic. But information about what? <laughs> right? We can ask information about what? Um, when it's not representable as correlators, as correlators, we know what it's information about. It's about you know where matter is and what matter does and and what kind of space time it lives in. But what is it information about when it's not representable as in terms of quantum fields in the curved space time? I don't know. And maybe you know that, that's also why I made this comment somewhere towards the end, saying that when we have these abstract correlators, which are just operators really, um, then we don't even have to interpret them as correlators. Ultimately, they're just operators. They're just abstract functions of multiple arguments. And um, as such, you know, it's kind of the most simple thing in mathematics. Something that depends on multiple entries. That's what it is, right? It's sort of the most basic thing you can think of in mathematics. It's like a function of an argument. <laughs> that's, that's what it would boil down to. And, and not just a collection of functions of n arguments. Remember, the partition function combines all of them, right? So ultimately, it's just one function. The whole thing is just one function. And then it can be 
decomposed by Taylor expanding it into its correlation functions, which then in certain regimes have representations in terms of uh, quantum fields that live on a curved space time. But mathematically, ultimately, it's, it's just a function, an abstract function. Ultimately, the partition function. Thanks. Um, you mentioned uh, in one of your slides about how in uh, standard quantum mechanics, we have the position operator. And so, you know, that, that gives us the position basis. But then when you only have the abstract correlators, you use the uh, higher order correlators. And when they're all simultaneously diagonal diagonalizable to find yeah. the position basis. But I was wondering about uh, a notion of distance in that case, because I was thinking if you have... Uh, basis where all these higher points uh, abstract correlators are simultaneously diagonalizable and these are the you know the x uh, coordinates for your position basis then any permutation of those x's might still also uh, give a, a diagonal basis so i'm wondering about a notion of distance between different x's in that case you know how, how that might emerge from that procedure of trying to extract uh, a position basis. Okay, um, uh, right. So, so this leads to two very interesting points, uh, a very interesting question. Um, so first of all, um, if they are all, let's assume for the moment that yes, all of the higher point correlators are diagonalizable in the same basis and a basis plural, right? They are diagonalizable not just in one basis, but in many bases. And the many bases are uh, different coordinate systems. And maybe I should say something about this. Um, consider the usual approaches to quantum gravity um, take very seriously the different morphism group, um, the, the invariance of the theory and the choices of coordinates, of coordinate system. It should, shouldn't depend on coordinate system choices. And the different morphism group is a really big group and to mod out by it is very difficult if, uh, if only we could do this. Now, that's general relativity. It has this different morphism invariance. Quantum theory has a much bigger invariance. It's the unitary invariance of the entire full unitary group of the Hilbert space. In quantum theory, we can change not only coordinates. For example, in, in three-dimensional Schrodinger theory, we can choose to go from Cartesian coordinates to polar or spherical coordinates, for example. That's just a unitary transformation. Changing coordinates is a unitary transformation. It's still the same theory, it's still unitary related. But in quantum theory, we can also go to momentum space. We can choose any basis we want, any orthogonal polynomial basis and whatnot. There are infinitely many choices, not only of coordinate system, but of bases in the Hilbert space. Let's put it this way. Every diffeomorphism is a unitary, but not every unitary is a diffeomorphism. So, for example, a Fourier transform is not a change of coordinates, but it's a unitary map. And what we did in this formalism is that we lifted the theory of gravity to have more than the diffeomorphism invariance. It has the unitary invariance because we're describing it in terms of, um, of quantities, these abstract operators that do no longer refer to uh, any position representation. As long as we have a formulation that refers to position representations, the max symmetry we can have is diffeomorphism invariance. But it comes with a tremendous cost, which is that we have to make the assumption that there is a space time to start with, and we have to fix the dimension of it as well. But that is biting us when we want to go to the Planck scale, where there may not be a position, there may not be a space time representation. So in order to free ourselves from that, we have to go beyond the diffeomorphism group. And the natural thing to do for GR is to take the group that quantum theory has anyway, which is the unitary group, much bigger than the diffeomorphism group, because as I said, every change of coordinates is a unitary, but not every unitary is a change of coordinates. For example, you know, going to uh, the Fourier transform already is not a change of coordinates. So, um, so what we have is this, we have, we have this in a huge uh, unitary group of um, the set of all fields. 
And um, and the theory that I talk about today has that um, unitary invariance built into it. And uh, and by the way, you may wonder what is what are the uh, uh, if you have a symmetry, you should have a conservation law. But diffeomorphism invariance is not a proper symmetry. Diffeomorphism invariance gives you some equations, but these are the so-called Bianchi identities. They're not conservation laws, but they're still useful. They give you, you know, asymmetries and asymmetries among the Riemann curvature tensor coefficients, indices, and stuff like that. And um, let me just remind you that the bigger symmetry, the unitary group of the Hilbert space, also has associated to it something like Bianchi identities, something like a conservation law. And what most people are not really appreciating enough is that the big unitary group of the Hilbert space in quantum theories has associated conservation laws. It's the commutation relations. The canonical commutation relations are preserved because the evolution is unitary. And the unitary symmetry is what is behind the canonical commutation relations, which I think is yet another reason for why we should lift um, if we are after quantum gravity, we should lift from just different morphism invariants all the way to the full unitary uh, invariants that quantum theories have. But that was just the first uh, th point that your question was pointing to, namely, what if we have position representations, then how can we go from one to the other and the unitaries and beyond unitaries? But there's also implied in what you asked, the question, how do we know that all of the higher order vertices can be diagonalized simultaneously? This is highly non-trivial. It is true in nature as we know it. In the standard model of particle physics, all the vertices are local. And the same statement is, it's equivalent to say that these vertices are diagonal in the same basis. And why that is, I don't know, I have no idea. But if we are after a theory of these abstract operators GN, then we need to explain that somehow. Why is it, why would it be that all the, the GN for N larger than two, all those vertices and renormalized vertices, why would they be diagonal in the same basis? Um, I don't know, but uh, somehow there's got to be a really good reason for that. It could, of course, be just um, that if we didn't, if if they were not diagonal in the same basis, then we wouldn't be able to exist in that universe or something like that, right? Um, it could be some entropic principle, but it seems that this is too fine tuned. There's got to be some good reason for why they are all diagonalizable simultaneously, and. Um, the mathematical question is clear. The answer is not, right? Uh, we, mathematically, we know what it means. All diagonalizers are in the same basis, but why the heck? I don't know. Well, I mean, one answer is that the uh, there's an underlying action, which is which has local vertices. It's not necessarily the unique answer, but that's one answer. Yes, well, that's right. Um, basically, what you're saying here is that I could... Uh, wait a moment, where is it? I have to go further. Uh oh, you see that? <laughs> uh, I have some extra slides in case you're interested, but wait, where is it? Where's the path in the core? Yeah, there it is. Right. Yes, the partition function and its properties uh, are the, uh, it, it, this is the Fourier transform of the classical action. And of course, yes, we could we can translate the question of why are these endpoint correlation functions diagonal in the same basis? We could translate that into a question about the classical action that we start with. That's right. Yeah, I mean, it's either why are all interactions local or why are all the endpoint correlators diagonal in the same basis? Um, one follows from the other, but why? Um, by the way, I have more slides, three more slides, <laughs> where... Um, I'll mean to show them. 
Really? Okay. If it, right. Anyone that, has, that wants to is free to leave. Thank yes, you. absolutely. <clears throat> okay, cool. Um, yes, this talk was about representations. And so now let, let's go completely off the rails and ask, <laughs> what about representations in, in other circumstances? <clears throat> and you all are familiar with ChatGPT and similar things. And I think there's something interesting to, to, to discuss also in that context from the perspective of representation theory. Namely, remember that um, the so-called transformers neural networks, um, such as GPT or GPT-4 or ChatGPT, they have been called statistical parrots because all they do is they learn correlations. They are fed text, they are fed like GPT-4 was fed like 10% of the internet, and it learned the correlations between words. And then just from the correlations, it figured out how to reply to, to prompts. But it actually does more than just learn correlations. It has been proven that large language models such as ChatGPT in the learning process actually built an internal model of what it is that they're learning. So for example, there is a board game, uh, which is called Otello. It's a bit like chess, but simpler. And you can write down a game, um, the course of a game, the same way you can write down chess. You can say, okay, A2 goes to B3 and C2 goes to D4, etc. right? And what they did is they trained um, at a chat GPT, um, a transformer model, they trained it um, on just a sequence of games, just games, games, games. They never told the machine what the game is. They just gave it sequences of D2s to, to, to E4 and stuff like that, right? And they didn't even say that these are moves on a board. They didn't say that this is happening on an eight by eight board and so on, nothing of that kind. But they found that once the system was trained, it had developed in its neuron activations a representation of a board, and it had understood the rules. And when it answers to a prompt, when you prompt it to predict what the next move should be, it actually looks at its internal representation of a board and then makes its move on the basis of the rules that it learned. It's amazing that it just was given these letters and numbers, and it figured out that what it was dealing with what a board and um, that there were mo allowed moves on that board and what the purpose of the game was. Now, um, animals are probably doing something similar. It's probably true that animals built an internal representation of the world as they see it for prediction purposes, right? I mean, any animal, maybe even plants, make, make models of what they are experiencing, because if they have a model, then the better the model, the better they can predict what the environment will do. And so they can proactively do things and reactively do things. They have an inner model of what's happening in their outer world. Now, some animals are sophisticated enough so that the representation of the world that they have in their brains contains not only their external worlds. No, the representation is sophisticated enough that it contains a representation of themselves. Those are the animals that, they, that can re recognize themselves in the mirror. Like, um, you know, I don't know, dolphins and monkeys and apes, uh, they, they can recognize themselves in the mirror, which indicates that their representation of the world includes themselves. So they have a concept of self. They have... Um, and the, the model is, is, that, is that sophisticated. But then some species even represent not only the world around them, not only themselves also, but also the representation process itself. You see what I mean? This means um, the animal is not only having in, in its mind a representation of the world around it, no, that representation includes themselves. And it also includes their own thinking, which means these animals can think about their own thinking. And um, th that's kind of, at that point, it becomes recursive because this, the thing, the, the animal is thinking about itself. It's thinking about its thinking process. 
it's reflected. When we say, when we say we are reflecting on something, right? Well, maybe that's what we are doing. We are being conscious. So what I'm conjecturing is that this, at the moment, this becomes recursive when the model of the world is so sophisticated that include that it includes the modeler and the model itself. When the model includes the model, then then maybe that is the spark, the beginning of, of consciousness. And if so, that would indicate when we will have to worry with, with artificial intelligence. It's perhaps when we build a conscious machine in that sense, where a machine would be declared conscious if it is modeling not just the world, but it's modeling also itself to the extent that it's modeling its own modeling process. So it monitors its own operations, its own thinking process, and thinks about itself thinking. And when such a machine says, um, could you please not switch me off? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Should we, should we take that seriously? Or should we just say, it's just electrons flowing in wires? I don't know. Um, I think it's a difficult question. And after all, we too, our brain is just made out of electrons and protons and neutrons too. So I don't know. Um, in any case, maybe Carl Sagan already anticipated the whole thing about representations because Carl Sagan said, the cosmos is within us. We are made of star stuff. We are a way of the universe to know itself. And that's the ultimate reflexivity, right? Where a universe brings about entities such as us who can think about the universe. So ultimately, the universe is here thinking about itself when we do physics. When we physicists do physics, it's really the universe thinking about itself because we are part of it, the universe. Anyway, <laughs> with this off the rails comment, I leave you, that's, that's all I have. Thank you for those extra thoughts. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Yeah, into Thank philosophy, you. I suppose. Thank you for listening to these things. Yeah. I would yeah. stop the recording. I really love the question you guys.